us this newbie. I, I really like the fact that you are uh, in this panel, especially because the viewpoint from jurisprudence and the Supreme Court is extremely important for our topic. I mean, several of the real challenges are, uh, are in, in your world somehow, through sentences, through the way in which judges approach issues, and sometimes they even transform in the real practice of the legal system uh, the rules. And uh, which goes from constitutions to the, you know, the each law and, and rule that we we have in our societies. So your viewpoint is crucial to see where we are going and what hopes and challenges we have for the future. So thank you. What gives you the right to be here this morning? What gives any of these panel members the right to say the things that they've said? Uh, are there police standing outside waiting to come in to arrest uh, you or us? Uh, I'm sure when I were I to run for re-election in 2020, this will probably uh, show up, uh, not in a favorable ad, by the way. Um, what, what kind of society are we living in? Have we forgotten the source of our rights? Thomas Jefferson said, if we forget the source of our rights, we will lose them. Um, if I ask that question, there would be many who perhaps would say, well, our rights come from the Constitution. Our rights come from the Bill of Rights. Um, how'd that work out for Nazi Germany? You see, if rights are given by other people, rights can be taken away. Jefferson and the, found, the framers, the founders, wrestled with this concept. Uh, don't our rights come from the king? For 99% of the history of the world, uh, people had thought, well, those in power give rights, and people can either accept that or suffer the consequences. Recently in North Korea, 87 people were publicly executed for the high crime of possessing some small portion of a copy of the Christian scripture. Um, government gives rights, people accept or suffer the consequences. Jefferson said, having reviewed history up to that point, he said there's got to be a different source. Um, certainly in uh, the English history, uh, William Penn at one point was a uh, street preacher and was preaching uh, the gospel message. He was arrested. He was tried for violating the laws of the church of the English laws at the time. The Church of English, Church of England was the only uh, accepted religion. Uh, the jury actually acquitted him. Uh, the judge put the jury in prison until they would change their verdict. Uh, find them. Uh, there was actually, under the English common law, a procedure where jurors could lose everything. Uh, fortunately, uh, William Penn was from an um, influential family, and uh, the jury was ultimately released due in part to the public outcry. We forget the backdrop of the founding of America. Uh, we've just been through Thanksgiving. Uh, that was um, initially, at least uh, uh, generally speaking, in, eight, in 1621 when the pilgrims gave thanks to Almighty God for their protection and deliverance. Um, the pilgrims had uh, been bounced around seeking simply to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Uh, North Carolina has an interesting history when you look at um, the attempts by the Church of England to uh, uh, send missionaries to North Carolina, but found it very unwelcoming. Uh, ultimately, uh, North Carolina disestablished the Church of England in our first constitution in 1776. And put in that constitution a provision that says each person 
has an inalienable right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own consciences. Very much mirroring what Jefferson had penned in our Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal and endowed not by the government or the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, property. Our rights come from God. Therefore, the Down syndrome child, who never knows what rights they have, have the same rights as the next Einstein. It doesn't matter whether you know you have these rights. You do. Why? Because you're created in the image of God. And God has imprinted upon you these rights. You only have two choices. Either your rights are a social contract. You give, you take away. That would be even in a constitutional setting. If your rights come from a constitution, that's a social contract. We've agreed. Or your rights come from God. And if your rights come from God, then the government cannot take them away, in theory. <laughs> the ACLU recently published this. We don't believe in religious liberty when it conflicts with our anti-discrimination agenda. One of the major political parties put this in their platform. We support a progressive vision of religious freedom that respects pluralism and rejects the misuse of religion to discriminate. What do they mean by that? Is that consistent with who we are, who we have been as a people? Joe comes to Jim Anthony, his employer, and says, I don't want to work on Sunday because I want to go up to the lake. Frank comes to Jim and says, I don't want to work on Sunday because I want to go to church. <coughs> Can Jim favor one over the other? Is there a public or a societal good to recognize that one person wants to be in church where the other person just wants leisure? I teach at Campbell Law School in addition to my day job. And what I have found out is that uh, young people have no appreciation for the importance of religious freedom. That in their minds, preferences are preferences. And if one wants to go to the lake and the other wants to go to church, somehow those are equal. And yet our founders would have been shocked at that. We were anticipating uh, historically uh, something that made no sense. We were getting ready to rebel against the greatest naval and military power in the world. We were a bunch of farmers and merchants. There is no way, short of the miraculous intervention of God, that we would be successful. So before July the 4th, 1776, there was a declaration by the U.S. Congress at the time. Of course, it wasn't quite U.S. It would have been the Continental Congress the same one that ultimately declared its independence. But before it did so, it knew that we needed a foundation, a spiritual foundation. We needed the intervention <coughs> of the sovereign God. <coughs> and so that Congress called for a time of national humiliation and prayer. But I want you to listen carefully to the words of that Congress because it so illustrates the foundation upon which this nation uh, is laid. Says, Congress desiring people of all ranks and decrees, duly impressed with a solemn sense of God's superintending providence, their duty devoutly to rely on God's aid and direction. We recommend Friday the 17th day of May, 1776, be observed by the colonies as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure, and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain this pardon and forgiveness. Ultimately, God heard and answered those prayers, 
And when you look historically, year after year of the Revolutionary War, and you see God's superintending protective hand of our armies, that we would ultimately prevail. You have to marvel that we would now want to run God out of the public square. And yet, recently, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear a case. There's a family in Washington, the state of Washington. They owned a uh, family pharmacy, been in the family for a while. Uh, being devout believers, they did not want to offer drugs that could cause abortions. Now, within a five-mile radius of this pharmacy, there were five other pharmacies who did not have the same conscientious objection. Keeping in mind that there are 6,000 drugs that are approved by the FDA, and there is no one pharmacy that carries all drugs, and it is very common within that industry to send people to different pharmacies to have their prescriptions filled. This religious objection did not sit well with some, particularly the governor of the state of Washington and his uh, commission. Ultimately, uh, that commission passed a law uh, that said, uh, you don't have to carry every drug you can make business decisions, but if and only if your objection is based on your religious conscience, uh, that violates the law. And you must carry that drug and you must hire individuals who will fill the prescriptions for those drugs. You cannot opt out. Well, this didn't seem right. Uh, something about the free exercise of religion uh, seemed to uh, run afoul of that. <coughs> Uh, the family uh, filed a lawsuit, and the district court agreed. The district court said, you know, words have meaning, and uh, certainly uh, the First Amendment's protection of, uh, regarding free exercise uh, would fall squarely upon these individuals uh, not wanting to uh, violate their religious conscience. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed and said, uh, if these people want to participate in the marketplace, they need to put their religious practice aside. Now, the Ninth Circuit pretty much adopted um, the view of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, they have a uh, pamphlet ent entitled Peaceful Coexistence, Reconciling Non-Discrimination Principles with Civil Liberties. Basically, what they said is, you can think whatever you want to. You can hold whatever views you want to have. Just keep them to yourself. And don't let them influence the way you act. So just keep them to yourself. That's what religious liberty means. Uh, you know, we're, we're at, not at yet. We're not going to enter your churches. Well, maybe sort of, kind of, but not with the stormtroopers yet. But Believe what you want to, just don't act on it. Come on, that's the way we can peacefully coexist with this. Unfortunately, uh, Justice Scalia died. It takes four votes of the U.S. Supreme Court to review a case. Uh, Justice Alito writing for three justices, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas, very much pointed to the um, irreconcilable uh, views that had been adopted by the Ninth Circuit when you compare that to our history of religious freedom and religious liberty. When we look at the ongoing attack on our freedoms, Religious liberty is the foundational freedom for freedom to assemble, freedom <clears throat> to speak, freedom for Mary to publish a book, freedom of the press. It's foundational to all these. I was recently at a conference where I heard those representatives of the ACLU, also known as law professors, um, 
first being very excited that they were able to bypass the democratic process, go straight to a favorable, favorable judge and get the rulings that they liked because they knew they never would be successful in the public square. They never would be successful in uh, uh, working through uh, the democratic process as it was designed to do. And pretty much uh, saying our next attacks are going to be on uh, those who have uh, strongly held religious conviction because they, that stands in the way of our agenda. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be aware of that. Now, I intentionally wore a Christmas tie today that has the wise men on it. Um, boy, 20 years ago, uh, most folks that I would encounter, most men would have some Christmas-themed tie uh, long about a couple weeks before Christmas. Uh, that number is certainly declining. Um, now, if I had worn something uh, Kwanzaa-related or uh, some other religion-related, I would be celebrated. Uh, oh, look at the open-minded justice. Oh, isn't that great? Uh, and frankly, in my chambers, uh, while we certainly have a Christmas tree and a nativity scene, uh, when I have had uh, law clerks of other faiths, I've encouraged them to help educate us about what it is that you believe. Like Jim, I believe that human existence uh, is uh, not just uh, our fleshly, earthly, or even our intellect, but we all have a spiritual being. Let me show you, tell you um, what I think is prima facie evidence that not only do we have a spiritual being or a spiritual nature, but that our society is slowly but surely killing itself by denying that. Do you know what the number one cause of death among middle school kids today. It's not car accidents. It's not going out and doing something dumb with fireworks or, um, uh, you know, it's not uh, uh, other types of accidents or playing football or any of those things, soccer. The number one cause of death among middle school kids is suicide. Why? Wow, I wonder why they think life is meaningless. Let's see, we tell them they're a cosmic accident created, well not really created, just kind of uh, evolved up from the goo, and uh, oh, uh, they can achieve whatever they want to, well, maybe not, and what's the point? What's the purpose? And these kids look at themselves and they look at life and they go, okay, fine, I'm just going to end it. Will we continue to deny this, the need that we all have to recognize um, the spiritual longing within each person. Washington, in his farewell address, looked carefully at the French Revolution and the reign of tyranny and compared that to the American Revolution experience. He warned us. He warned us that there are two foundational principles for self-government. He said, our experience of self-government relies upon a moral and a religious people. And he said in his farewell address, I've looked at it, and I don't think you can have morality apart from religion. Therefore, if you love America and you love self-government, encourage religious people. Encourage religious practice. Certainly that was echoed by Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America as he too looked at the travesty, the reign of terror of the French Revolution, the <clears> godless <throat> atheist French Revolution. And he looked at America and he said, what's the difference? He too ultimately decided it was because of the religious practice and that practice leading to an ethic, uh, morals, 
that say, you know, I may want this, but I'd rather have what's good for my society, good for my culture, good for my community. One, to set aside personal self-interest for the well-being of others. Why? Because Jesus tells us to do that. Is not that at the heart of the threats that we experience as we seek to live out our faith? Uh, I was impressed by this data about uh, suicide rate. I, I, I knew about, about uh, uh, the issue, but it made me think. Uh, some people think that the dignity of the human being is, uh, lies in being free. Usually this is a typical way to express it. We are free beings and that's our dignity. Well, that's not the whole story for Christians. It's definitely much bigger uh, of a deal. Our dignity lies in being called to a divine life with, uh, with God. So is, imagine that you're watching a movie and you see this very common person in the movie, right? Then all of a sudden you discover that this person is called to be the king. He's the son of the king. Now, wow, everything is changing, right? This person looks much more important now because of his call or her call. Well, this is pretty much what, what happens with us. I mean, uh, Tolkien used to uh, wrote that in his cosmo cosmogony that death is the greatest gift that God gave to us because it's the sign that this is not the whole picture, that we are called to something much higher than that, which we don't know exactly what it is, but it's eternal, it's with God, and it's a higher dignity. So it's like we all are the children of the king, <laughs> and our real life is higher than what we see around us. If we don't see a higher truth, we might lose hope, and mm -hmm. maybe there is no reason to uh, live in a world that doesn't give a better, a bigger perspective. <coughs> so we should recall that. I'm actually, I'm not just uh, interpreting it. If you open the catechism and you see the first points of the dignity of the human being, you will not find just freedom. You will find the higher call to be uh, divine in God. I mean, that's, that's what, we, what we really believe. And so this is a sign of hope. Without religion, we are doomed to a meaningless life that will, is going to end in a few years in, in nothing.